Hello, everybody. <clears throat> We're here today to say hi. Um, they say that uh, you should try to get yourself in your video, so here I am. Hello. Uh, today we'll <clears throat> be discussing uh, the, a topic of robotics, a specific topic inside of robotics, which <clears throat> we call a linear actuator or a simple linear actuator. It's a a topic that we think is important uh, and useful and can help to let people enjoy robots. We do want to bring to your attention a, a disclaimer, which is that physically real parts of a robot, including a linear actuator, do move around. It's possible that these parts could get tangled up in a person and hurt a person. This is particularly true if this part is being used with children. It is our advice, do not make a physically real version of this uh, item unless you have the legal permission to do so. And in addition, you have the training and knowledge and experience and a robust safety program so that if you make a physically real version of this item that uh, it will be safe and reasonable, and there is a very, very low probability that anyone would be hurt. And in addition, if this is a product for children, that you uh, adjust your safety parameters on this item so that they are appropriate for the age of the children that you are going to be supplying it to. Otherwise, once again, we're glad you're here, and let's let's talk about robots. Okay. Hey, everybody. I thought I would just talk about something kind of interesting. This is from Thompson. Um, Thompson Linear. Um, www.thompsonlinear.com downloads. And it's showing an item called a ball screw. This is an item that converts rotary motion of this shaft into linear motion of this thing that's on this shaft. And the convention of the way people talk is that this shaft is called a ball screw. And this item is called a ball nut. And this works exactly as though you had a threaded shaft that had a nut on it, except in between this nut and this screw are ball bearings. That's why these threads are so wide and round, because there's a steel ball sitting right here. And that steel ball is in between this shaft and this nut. And when this you can well you can turn them both if you want but what usually happens is this nut is prevented from turning and this shaft is turned and so when this shaft turns around and around and around this nut will move this way or that way the ball bearing nature of it gives you two or three unique features one unique feature is that the friction of turning it is extremely low so that you can turn this and make turn this shaft and make this nut move and the frictional losses that you are creating in turning the shaft are very low because it's a ball bearing system the other thing is that since this is a ball bearing riding in its raceway you can get these tolerances fairly tight so that this does not wiggle back and forth very much. The final thing is that you can generate fairly significant pressures, forces, because this is all, it can certainly be made where this is all steel. The main disadvantage of this particular way of doing this is that it's very expensive. And as you do the things that make it expensive, like better steel, higher tolerances either when you make this very big like this dimension is two inches or when you make it very small like this dimension is two millimeters 
that also runs up the expense. What I wanted to do, I had an interest in robots, and I wanted to make a robot that moves and looks like a human being when it's moving. And most of the robots that you see, the way the force, the force device that makes motion occur is a rotary motion device using really a rotary motion encoder to talk to the computing system to tell the rotary motion device, let me rephrase that, to tell the computer how much the rotary motion device has moved. And so they're making human robots using rotary motion devices. All right, welcome back. So I thought I would show you the robot that I created. And I didn't think you should make a robot that moves using rotary motion encoders forcing rotary motion because that's not how human beings work. Human beings work with muscles and muscles make essentially a type of linear motion they can contract. Now pistons surprisingly can expand or contract. Um, but I think that motion is closer to the way the human being moves. And I thought we could make, or I could make a robot that moves a lot more like a human being and looks a lot more like a human being. If we took the robot and gave it a motion system that is like what human beings have. And, uh, I just think it looks more human and, it's not nearly as convenient as rotary motion encoders because the technology and the science and the programming of rotary motion devices is quite well established. If you have the objection to make a robot that moves like a human being, looks like a human being, then it needs to be put together like a human being. It needs to have the joints like a human being has in about the same proportions with the same ranges of motion. Now, this is actually being shown in a uh, key shot uh, because, mainly because key shot is just pretty. Um, and this is some video trickery that I did in SketchUp, actually. This was created in SketchUp and sent to Keyshot, and I took some grass that you can make in uh, Keyshot. This is using, there's a uh, scatter, I can't quite remember what, but anyway, it lets you make grass, and then you can take this grass image and lay it out horizontally, and then I went out in the backyard and took a picture of a tree, or a set of trees, and you can take that picture in SketchUp and lay it out sort of semi-vertical. And then you can lay the robot or stand the robot in front of it. And if you move your image position closer and obscure the fact of what you've done, you can get this image of the robot standing around out there in the forest. And this is my little robot that's saying hi. But what I wanted you to see was... Uh, uh, that this robot has articulations and joints like a human does. In other words, it's got a knee, and the knee can only do one motion. The foot can go this way or that way. And actually, if the foot goes this way until the point where the knee is completely straight, the foot doesn't go forward any more than that because this is a robot constructed to behave like a human and this robot has a set of hips and this um, this uh, hip here you know if you take this whole leg this whole leg can swing back and forth this way so that's abduction adduction of the hip the hip the whole entire leg can also swing forward and backward. That's flexion extension of the hip. And the last thing that the hip can do is the, um, 
the foot here can turn, turn this way or that way, and that's internal and external rotation of the hip. And this is all stuff that if you're not used to dealing with human beings, it can get very confusing like, well, just hang on a second. If you have internal and external rotation of the hip, why are you pointing at the foot? And the truth is, for human beings, they don't truly comprehend that they're internally and externally rotating their hip. They don't notice that. The knee does not have any rotation. So if you look down with your head at your foot and rotate your foot in and out, in your mind, you're rotating your foot. But you are not rotating your foot. The ankle cannot rotate. And the knee cannot rotate. The hip can rotate. And you just have to accept that. The human brain doesn't let you notice any of this because you would go, you would become so confused you would not know what you were doing. But the hip is one of those very few joints in the human body that has movement in three different axes. Abduction, adduction of the hip, flexion, extension of the hip, internal, external rotation of the hip. And this robot does this. And if you look at the rotary encoder robots many of them don't and when they do it doesn't look very normal so we'll let him look at you one more time goodbye mr robot i put a little smile on his face why not um and i took some images of this keyshot lets you make extremely high quality images and i put 30 or 40 megabyte PNG images on my website of this with this little guy waving at you. So now we're going to go back into Keyshot, uh, excuse me, into SketchUp and get the SketchUp version of this. All right. Well, welcome back, everybody. I, I made a mistake. I, the grass that I was showing you was not grass that was created in Keyshot. It's actually a program called Scatter that you can get in SketchUp and it allows you to take various um, JPG or PNG files like these little tufts of grass and this is one of these things where if you're rich enough to have a great computer then it's fun if you have to do what I do with what I can afford you just have to wait because it's creating all of this grass. But you can hear a little pathway here. And then if you just wait a while, it will render out the grass. And you can have a lot of fun with it. You can put stuff down in there and you can have a tree scene like I, I did with the robot. And you can see that it's working. And as the computer adds more detail to it, it's prettier. That's the grass. The other thing that I forgot to mention um, I had just finished working on the arm of the robot. Now, the shoulder of a human being is another structure that has three degrees, three axes of motion. And you can get the human shoulder to behave as though the human arm um, is rotating when actually it isn't. It's all linear motion. And the final thing I, I need to say is technically the blue thing here is the piston. This entire structure of a connecting rod, a piston, connecting points, a cylinder that whole system is called a hydraulic cylinder and this is actually the piston or the piston head and you can see that this particular I call it a piston is only connected here but the other way that pistons are very well understood by human beings is to mount the piston in the back and mount the other end of it in the front and again this is a hydraulic cylinder but we call them pistons because everybody does and 
what I was demonstrating with this shoulder is the various uh, motions of the arm that can be achieved using a piston-based protocol. And you will not find rotary encoder robots that have shoulders that can work like a human shoulder, but this robot can. And I was just showing off him or her standing there pointing his hand up in the air and waving on this material, so this floor that I put in here. And this is the robot that was used to create the robot that was waving. And uh, uh, 464 here, I think, is just a more refined version of it. And so there it is. Uh, oh, I turned turned his hand around. And these are all motions that human beings can do. It's it's exactly like internal external rotation of the foot. It's not when you get your hand to go where your thumb is pointing towards your chest and get your hand to where your hand is pointing away from your chest. It's very surprising exactly what you're doing. Um, and when you have your uh, elbow in a manner where your hand is pointing up, as opposed to having your elbow in a manner where your hand is pointing down, this involves motions of the shoulder that are not necessarily intuitively obvious. Um, and the reason, and I'm, and I'm not going to get deeply inside of this. I have talked about it elsewhere. But all of these motions are very natural looking, and the proportions of this robot, that's about the same size. I mean, he, I guess he's a bodybuilder, but this is about the same size as a human being. And the shoulders are about what shoulders look like. None of that will you see with the rotary encoders. If you do, and you watch the motions they make, the motions do not look human. It's not a pleasant robot to look at. But what I wanted to discuss is I thought it would be fun to try to get this to be a robot that was a toy that people could assemble and have some fun with it. But controlling a piston is tough because you have to have fluid under pressure, have to have valves. If you want this to go that way, you have to take fluid out of this side and you have to put fluid into this side and the fluid coming into this side has to be pressurized and the fluid coming from that side has to go back to the pump. It's very complicated. And I wanted to create a device that had all of the features of a hydraulic cylinder but actually did not involve moving any fluids around or pressurizing any fluids. And this is what the little linear actuator was that I'm going to talk about. And of course, I also wanted it to be a toy. So this linear actuator has to be inexpensive enough that people can buy five or six of them and make a little robot. Um, one of the things I guess I should mention about, you might be saying to yourself, where did this pelvis come from? But in order to have internal and external uh, rotation of the uh, hips you have to have the structure of the hip on a pivot point that is a vertical connection that's this vertical connection but if you have it on a vertical connection then inside of it you have to have a piston a hydraulic cylinder that can grab a hold of this device and rotate it and that's what gives you internal and external rotation of the hip, which human beings perceive as being internal and external rotation of the foot. That's where this pelvis comes from and why it looks like this. But what surprised me as I created the robot, it just was remarkable that it began to look like a human being. It just was really interesting. Anyway, so now we're going to stop on all of this robot stuff and go over to the specific topic of creating... A linear actuator and the final thing I guess I should these are the anti-gravity muscles of the human body there are muscles that move the legs but there are other muscles that move the human being up away from the ground and the muscles that move the legs may not need to be so big but the muscles that get the human being up away from the ground are reacting and countering the weight of the human so the anti-gravity muscles are bigger 
than the non-anti-gravity muscles to give enough strength to the robot to be able to move itself up off the ground. That's what this is about. All right, so we're going to stop all of this, and we're going to go over and start talking about a way to make a uh, an L, L, uh, inexpensive El Cheapo version of a hydraulic cylinder. All right, and of course, once again, welcome everybody. We're glad that you're here. Uh, I know you're all going to say, you know, that looks like that grass again. And it is, because I wasn't completely correct on this grass. The grass is an extension that you can get for SketchUp. It's an extension that runs in SketchUp. And what it does is it allows you to define an area, and then you can scatter onto that area recurring uh, iteration, uh, recurring instances of something else, and it will scatter it at the density you want and in a random manner. And these little things are not JPGs; these are uh, actual SketchUp drawing files of various types of grass. And um, I don't know if I can get it to show it to you, but these are what you can take. It's going really slow. Okay, so this is a drawing from SketchUp of uh, blades of, of different types of grass. And then you take these blades of grass and you put them over here into this surface and it generates a file that's pretty big and you can see that my computer is having a little trouble doing it but it's pretty the thing to remember is if you have the patience to mess around with it it's pretty uh, and you can put him him or her out there standing in the forest with his feet in the grass so there you go all right the other thing we wanted to uh, uh, remind you about is um, I keep saying that we don't actually have rotation and I think I pro probably need to clarify that a little bit so I will tell take this and pull it over here uh, when you're moving this robot around okay so here's the here's the head here's the, the piece he's waving out there he's got his palm out and everything right hand left arm is here so now we're going to start going down these structures and um, they all have names and their name is group and the reason why their name is group is because that's the name that SketchUp gives them unless you do something else and I typically tend to not name them because it just takes a lot of time but we're getting to this is the whole left arm that is the whole left arm so we could take the view and hide the rest of the arm and so now we are looking at the whole left arm and then we're going to do some more on that because what we want to look at is the motion uh this is abduction and adduction which is where you you're well it's in the textbooks all right let's go on down to flexion or um, rotation For flexion and extension, I, I, I went too far down into this. So now we're in flexion and extension. And we'll take this and put it out of the way so it's not bothering anybody. I tend to put in my drawings these little indexing marks. And I have them as a flat triangles. Because when you take the rotation option in SketchUp, it 
you can force it to rotate you know, red or blue or green. But if you want it to rotate in the plane of whatever item you're trying to rotate, if you'll put these little objects here, indexing objects that have some size to them, it forces this circle of rotation to index itself onto the plane of whatever it is you're rotating. And SketchUp tends to help you a lot. You notice that it keeps trying to make it something else, but if you put it here and hold down the Shift key, it will maintain that. There. Okay. So now we can back out. And this is flexion and extension of the arm. And these naming conventions are just naming conventions. But there is the arm. And you see it rotating around the shoulder so you're like well hang on a second i thought you said it, uh, it didn't have rotation in human beings and in terms of a rotary joint a true rotary joint so there's the hand we go all the way around like this and come back to where we were and we've done 360 degrees an actual rotary joint could do 720 degrees a real rotary joint could do 3600 degrees or 3600 degrees or 12,000 degrees that's an actual rotary joint which human beings do not have and the reason why human beings do not have this is because nerves and blood vessels travel across these joints and in order to have a true rotary joint you would have to have a rotary union for the nerve and the vein and the artery and human beings don't have that so they don't they have rotational motion but they do not have rotary joints and uh that's just something to mention because uh, otherwise you'll be confused because you might say well if we have all this rotation type activity going on with a human being why are we trying to do this with pistons and my answer is because that's the way the human beings do it. And I think you're going to get an easier movement, a more natural movement, a movement that people will like. And I believe a movement that's easier to program if you get away from rotary actuators. So just some clarification. Now we're going to go over and try to look at the toy. All right. And once again, welcome back, everybody. We're glad you're here. Uh, if, if you will uh, talk to my friends, they will bring to your attention uh, very quickly that I can take almost any topic and make it boring. And I'm trying not to be boring, but we are talking about a motion using a ball nut ball screw system. And if you go look it up on the internet, you're going to find and say, uh, that's not how they use ball nuts and it's not how they use ball screws. And what are you talking about? And so I just wanted to show you that boy, there is more about ball nuts and ball screws than you could ever want to know. Uh, this is the ball nut. It rotates around and around. And when it, if this shaft is held still and isn't moving, then if the ball nut goes around and around and around, the ball nut will move. And conversely, if this shaft is held still and this ball nut is prevented from rotating and the shaft rotates, then when the shaft rotates, the ball nut will move back and forth. And you can see um, that really this just goes on and on and on and on. And what is going on... Um, so here we have an example, um, KSS ball screws. Here you can see a ball nut with the screw. It's a very typical configuration. And the motor turns the shaft. The shaft is held so it doesn't go anywhere. These ball nuts are held so they don't turn. And so what happens is when you turn the shaft, the these two structures can go back and forth in a very controlled manner that's very precise. And that is what how they are frequently used. The 
precision and strength and the non uh, bending nature of these materials allows them to be used to make moving stages for 3D printers or multi-axis milling machines. You can see that the thickness of this shaft is extremely thick compared to the size of these threads. And the reason for that is the thickness of this shaft determines how rigid it is. Another uh, example, which is closer to what I'm talking about, is from Thompson Linear, where they have a motor turning a ball nut that's been stabilized, and the shaft is held so it doesn't turn. And when the shaft, uh, let me rephrase that, it doesn't go anywhere, it just turns. And when it turns, it acts on the ball nut to move this in and out and i think you can imagine just by looking at this what it would cost and these are made for professional highly technical movement activities and we're trying to make something that's a toy so we're going to take all of the principles involved in the ball nut ball screw system and we're going to try to factor away from it everything that makes it expensive but keep the parts of it that make it useful so again here we go this is this uh, same um, image of the ball nut ball screw system where you can see these strange ball shaft thread and there's the ball nut on it and you have all of this incredibly technical data which is important if you're using this thing in a machine that's going to do something very specific but the effect that you get from all of this technical perfection is unbelievable chrome molybdenum stainless steel it's way too expensive to be using this as a toy. There's the motor. There's the ball shaft. Here's the ball nut. So let's go see what we're going to do and see what can be done to make this something that's available that has the advantages of the ball nut ball shaft system, which is very low torque, frictional torque for moving it. And... Uh, that you have pretty good precision of motion and you have a nice way to convert linear, excuse me, rotary motion into linear motion. <clears throat> I guess the other advantage that I should remember to mention is that the, you can see that the ball shaft, ball nut, is different from the motor, which means that you can alter the performance of this device the power and the speed of it by changing the motor without necessarily being required to change the ball nut or the ball shaft. That's pretty nice. Okay, so enough of that. We'll go over to the one that I designed, and here's the beginning of it. And um, my objective is to have what we want, but not have that price or that complexity. And we're gonna get back to that, or go to more of that, with the next thing. So let's, we'll wrap this up and go on to the next one. All right. And once again, uh, we're back. This is uh, KSS ball screw uh, special requirements. Small. Look at the size of that. Here is something interesting plastic. This is a, uh, a, a device where the, um, ball shaft threads are plastic and the ball nut itself is plastic isn't that interesting this is something that could be used in an environment where you would have corrosion of metal um the other thing is oh my goodness that's a penny so making these smaller is not impossible I do believe making them smaller when they're highly accurate, well-made, highly expensive technical materials, it actually becomes more expensive to make them small, not less expensive. So we need to go discuss this in a manner where we're trying to keep the price down. 
Um, now, <clears throat> one of the things that we, we should discuss is exactly what is going on with a ball nut and a ball shaft. And I've done my a guess at trying to duplicate that inside of SketchUp. And so I've taken a cylinder and cut a semicircular groove in the cylinder. And in that semicircular groove is a little tiny ball bearing. It's about, if this is half of it, so the ball bearing is going to be like this big around. And it rolls inside of this. So if you go and try to look at it, you can see that this, my little ball nut that I created in SketchUp has this uh, semicircular groove that goes around and around and around. And the ball shaft has a uh, semi a circular type of groove in it um, you can see that I've, I've shown this as an a bulging portion of this shaft because this bulging portion of the shaft represents what the ball bearing looks like so the real shaft uh, has an absence of material here and in between so the shaft the diameter of this shaft is less than the diameter shown here because in between the shaft and the nut are the ball bearings and that's not too complicated the tricky part of a ball nut ball shaft system is that if you just ran this, the ball bearings would go down this thing to the end of this nut and they would just fall out of the nut and they wouldn't be there anymore. And what is expensive and technical with a ball nut is that it has a scooping mechanism here that grabs the ball bearings and sends the ball bearings back to here and then they get back into this tra traverse and they go back down this nut again. So the ball bearings are going around in a loop inside of this ball nut and they're rolling in this groove this groove that's inside of the ball nut and the groove that's inside of the shaft and uh, this is my attempt to demonstrate that i basically took a coil like structure that's a solid and wrapped it around this shaft and then i subtracted this solid from the shaft and so you have this shaft that has this grooved loss of material in it and you can see from the way that i did this that this groove is too far down and this just involves messing around with it you this shaft needs to be a little less diameter but i wanted you to see how it works the actual construction of it <clears throat> is not necessarily what we're going to get into in depth because <coughs> that is put together by the people who will actually make it. I just wanted you to have the concept of what is going on with a ball nut and a ball screw. The ball nut has those grooves inside of it and the ball screw has those grooves around it and what is in between the ball the shaft of the ball shaft and the ball nut is the ball bearings and the um uh fi the final version of the item that i was creating <coughs> involved this <coughs> um ball shaft that i created it's not completely correct but there's no need to redraw it just be aware that this is a ball shaft and the uh, ball nut is right here and so once you understand that we have a ball shaft and a ball nut we can begin to discuss what we're going to do to get the price to be low okay 
And once again, everybody, welcome back. We are glad you're here. We're looking at the structure that I was wanting to propose. Um, I should say the one I wanted to make, you can see that this distance is two and a half inches. That distance is two and a half inches and that distance is 11 inches. So surprisingly with the robot, um, I'm not going to be at all surprised the travel of this device, this can travel up this way. So this has a travel of about 10 inches. In the human body, humans, joint structures are a leverage system where levers are used so that the muscle moves an inch or so. For example, the muscle in your thigh that makes your foot move forward. That muscle shortens itself by an inch or two, and your foot moves forward by 12 to 14 inches. And this is done all over the human body, where the linear motion of the muscle is magnified by a lever magnification type of linkage. So I'm not going to be at all surprised if many of the pistons of the piston robot do not need to be this long. They don't need to be, this was two and a half inches, so this is almost five times as long as it is wide. I think that's going to be not common. Before we get into this specifically, there's one other feature of uh, pistons or hydraulic uh, cylinders that we ought to look at for you to understand and we're going to set this up and we're going to drill down here's a here's a piston well let's not pick it. let's pick this one this is one that people are are familiar with this format of a piston or a hydraulic cylinder again i call them pistons because everybody calls them pistons but they're hydraulic cylinders Okay, here is a hydraulic cylinder. And uh, one of the things that a hydraulic cylinder can do is a hydraulic cylinder can move in a linear fashion this way. That is pretty much all that it does. Another thing that's important about a hydraulic cylinder is that it has stability against deformation so that this does not happen that is a deformation on the green axis and of course this is a deformation on the blue axis hydraulic cylinders when they push out there is a force on them to try to make them bend like this but when they generate their force to push out, they are constructed in a manner where they don't have that deformation of their shape. When they pull, it's mostly just a tension or traction effect. But it's important to understand this concept of something that happens with hydraulic cylinders that's important to know about, which is that they move in their one axis of motion that they move in, which is to lengthen or to shorten themselves but they do not allow themselves to be distorted or to be brought out of alignment from any other axis. That's an important thing to remember. All right, so now we'll go back over here to the uh, drive that I constructed. And we are now all experts on ball shafts and ball nuts. And so uh, one thing we can do if we want to is take this structure right here and kind of drill down on it. And you can see that this um, is a ball nut in there down inside of this thing is a ball nut. Now, this 
is a ball nut. This is a flange. This flange allows you to take the ball nut and get the activity of the ball nut to be doing something that you want it to do. Or conversely, you can apply a force to this flange and when you apply a force to this flange, the force that you're applying to the flange becomes a force that's applied to the ball nut. So almost always, wherever you look with the ball nut, ball shaft system, there's going to be a part of it where the ball nut is doing its thing and another part of it where you are either placing mechanical energy into the ball nut or you are extracting mechanical energy from the ball nut and in the same manner you are either placing rotational energy into the ball shaft or you are extracting rotational energy or movement energy from the ball shaft so there you go and now we'll back back out of this thing so um, you can see um, Here it is, and I've got it in this x-ray version of looking with SketchUp, which is okay. The x-ray version is not bad. It's hard on SketchUp to draw it. It uses up your CPU power, and it can be a little bit confusing because you can lose your orientation of what you're looking at. So I'm going to uh, back off on the x-ray view. Now, what I did do, what I've seen that helps a lot is to take certain portions of the drawing and alter the opacity of the structure and the reason I altered the opacity of the structure is so that you can see through it to see what's going on it is not actually glass or translucent plastic or some metal that you can see it's none of that I myself made it have decreased opacity so you can see through it to help you to see what's going on. That's important to understand. All right, we're now completely experts on ball nut and ball shaft, and we're going to show how this thing will function for us, I hope. All right, and again, once again, hello, everybody, and welcome back. Uh, we're glad you're here. Here is our uh, little uh, device that we're going to be talking about. Uh, the important thing to remember about it is that it is two and a half inches by two and a half inches by 11 inches. So it's not very big. It's a two inch by two inch piston that's 11 inches long. But I think you can understand, actually, if you wanted to, you can simply trim this ball shaft down to whatever length you want and, and nothing would change if you made this ball shaft shorter and you made these two support beams shorter you would have a piston that was smaller or shorter or you would have the mechanical equivalent of a hydraulic cylinder which i'm going to call a piston because it's just so much trouble to keep saying all that over and over again but you would have it shorter without having to change much of anything and what we want to address is this structure up here that is the place where the ball nut is turned. And I should bring to your attention that this is a little... Um, now, you see this? This is a bounding box problem. See how the uh, gear motor disappeared? And if you pull it back a little bit, the gear motor comes back. And this is just because SketchUp has a little trouble drawing stuff this small. And it's not a crisis. It's just weird and a little irritating, but it's easily fixed. But I, if you see that, it doesn't mean anything. It's just a bounding box problem. But this is a little motor, and this motor spins this gear, so this RPM is reduced, and this gear turns that gear. 
and so this RPM is reduced, and this gear turns that gear, and so this RPM is reduced. So this is stepped down by one, two, three, four. So it's stepped down four times, and then it's stepped down one more time because this turns around and turns this gear. So when this turns around, it turns this gear, and this gear turns this structure, and this structure has inside of it um, the ball nut right there. So this little tiny motor is turning this gear and is turning that ball nut, and that ball nut is making this ball shaft move. And uh, prior to going through how all this is created or why it's made this way, I think we have to talk a little bit about bearings. And we'll go over here. Uh, this is this times 100. Because what happens with SketchUp is all these problems that you run into with SketchUp disappear if you make the object bigger. So it's all nothing more than a bounding box issue. That's it. So you just make it bigger. All right. So bearings are an important topic. And I have prepared for you my little wooden bearing demo. And if you have a mechanic, bearings revolutionized mechanical energy and the life of human beings. Bearings give human beings the ability to very reproducibly and reliably control very big forces. If you have something that's moving and you want it to stay in a particular location, so you have something that's moving in a particular location and you want to have something else that's not moving, that's holding it from moving around, that's a bearing. So we have this shaft here and we've taken these little clamps and we've bolted this shaft to this piece of wood. And so this shaft is going nowhere and it's in place. And somebody might say, yeah, but hang on a second, because I actually, I wanted this shaft to turn around in circles, round and around and around like this. And you're like, well, okay. And you loosen these bolts. And so you have constrained the shaft from this motion. The shaft can't do this. The shaft also can't do this because you fixed it. But these are loose enough that it can turn. Now you're going to have frictional losses between this metal hasp and the shaft, and you're going to have friction where the shaft is rubbing on the wood. And so now you can start to do things to make yourself have a better bearing. And uh, that's the bearing discussion. Um, and it's the next thing that we're going to do because there's a lot of things that you can do with bearings to make your bearing system give you the results that you want. And that'll be our next topic. All right, and uh, welcome back again. I guess for this, I'll be the bearing boy. And here's the bearing table that I prepared. Now, when this metal shaft is turning and being held against this metal hasp, you have metal to metal and you have this metal moving with respect to that one, and it acts in an abrasive manner where one of these two pieces of metal or both of them is going to get worn out, which is makes your bearing not work right. And there's ways to solve that. And an issue associated with bearings includes the particulars of your bearing. How big is it? How much force is it going to be controlling? What is the maximum amount of force that you want it to be able to control just in case? Is it made of exotic materials? Is it exposed to a harsh chemically reactive environment? Is this a life safety bearing where human beings stay alive if it works? Is this a bearing that is put up in outer space where if it fails, it's, ex it's, a, it's a catastrophe because it's not really fixable? Is it made of exotic materials? What are the tolerances for the bearing? Is it extremely precise? 
How fast is the bearing going to go? Does it need to be balanced? How much do you want to pay for this bearing? All of these issues are very important. And the reason I mention them is if you go and look up bearings, they all seem to look the same. And one bearing costs $400 and one bearing costs $4. And you might be saying, what, what is going on here? Oh, another issue that's important with bearings is protection from, by patent or intellectual property rights where somebody wants to make a bearing, but somebody else has patented a pretty simple and cool way of doing that. And so they make a bearing that's different. And you might look at it and say, that's a weird looking bearing. Why are they doing that? And it isn't necessary for it to look like that. Sometimes that is happening because they're going around or of, uh, having their own version of intellectual property rights or patent protection. Um, and sometimes you can just get stuff that looks strange and that's what they're doing. All right. So now here we have metal. This metal has been optimized. This hasp metal has been optimized to be strong and hold things. And this shaft has been optimized to be a shaft. And these two metals, when they rub on, rubbing on each other, may not necessarily have a good uh, outcome. And what you can do is create what's called a bushing, which is a bushing bearing. Sometimes these bushings are made of a softer material, softer metal, and they are under pressure impregnated with oil, so they slowly release oil. And that acts as a lubricant. And what happens is you start out with this, which is a bearing. It'll work. It's a bad bearing. But it's cheap and inexpensive and clever and simple. But you could put in these brass or bronze oil-impregnated bushing bearings. And now this isn't moving. This bushing isn't moving. This shaft is turning around. The shaft is rubbing on the bronze, and the bronze is made for that. And the bronze slowly wears down, but not very fast. It releases oil, and you have the motion of one metal against another metal occurring where you wanted it to, instead of this metal rubbing against that metal. There is some frictional losses, particularly if there's a lot of strain or pressure on this shaft. Uh, for example, this shaft pushing that way this shaft pushes against this bronze and it generates friction and one of the things you can do to make that frictional loss less is to create a ball bearing and uh, as you can this is clearly more complicated than that but it has many advantages and the way a ball bearing works is i put this in it's not required but this is here just as a spacer uh, it wouldn't necessarily be a bushing at this a bushing bearing at this point because this is not moving res with respect to the shaft. So this is inside of this raceway. This raceway has carved into it this semicircular groove. Inside of this raceway sit these little balls. These balls are in that raceway, and this. Um, These have a name, and I can never remember what it is. I'll call it a spacer. This spacer keeps these balls separated where they're supposed to be. In a bearing like this that's going around like this, these balls, this ball is going around like this. This ball is also going around like this, which means that this edge of this ball is going that way. And this edge of this ball is going that way. So if this ball was touching that ball, the place where they touch would be one going this direction and one going that direction, which is a frictional loss. And the way you prevent that is you separate them with this spacer. It also keeps them symmetrically arranged around the shaft. And then there is a final uh, piece. Again, now, once again, I have adjusted the opacity of this metal so that you can see what's going on in there. Uh, normally, this would all be like magic. But this is a piece of metal, and it has a semicircular raceway cut into it. 
So there's that bounding box again. And that semicircular raceway is, is where this side of the ball is touching. And so what happens is you can take your external circle and lift up your hasp or your gripper and pull down on this pretty tight. This shaft is inside of here spinning around and these little balls are spinning around in their raceway. And you have a much decreased frictional pressure to turn the shaft because the balls are rolling on each other. And in addition, you get all of the things that you can do with ball bearings, including increasing the quality or the nature of the metal and increasing the hardness of the metal, increasing the strength of the metal, increasing the heat tolerance, increasing the tolerances with which you've polished it and balancing it. So you can get bearings that can do all sorts of things. Unbelievable capabilities not really available with this system and absolutely not available with this system and the final thing and this is where bearings get really weird um there's that bounding box issue again if you move this shaft this is here's the center of the shaft that's a radius of this shaft so these are the radius of the shaft and motion of the shaft along its radius is called radial motion Remember that bearings have been around for 200 years. All these words were created a long time ago. I didn't make these words. So there. But this is a radial motion of the shaft. And this is a radial stabilization of the shaft. It's prevented from moving in its radius. You might say, well, there you go. But somebody might bring to your attention, uh, you know what? What if the shaft wanted to do that? And you would say, um, and that is because this is considered the axis of the shaft, the long axis of the shaft, and motion in this direction is considered axial motion. And axial motion is a different motion. It's 90 degrees apart from radial motion. And if you want to stabilize a shaft against axial motion, then you have to have an axial bearing, which is referred to as a thrust bearing. Why is that? I don't know. I assume they used to have, for example, ships with a propeller on a shaft and the propeller is pushing the water, but the way it's pushing the water is it's generating a thrust against this shaft. And if you don't have a thrust bearing, then when you spin the propeller up, what will happen is the shaft will go up inside the ship, up inside the motor, and ruin the motor. So while you do have to stabilize the shaft against radial motion, you also have to stabilize it against axial motion, and that's a thrust bearing. And the way that a thrust bearing works is the little uh, balls, a ball bearing thrust bearing has these little balls that are pressing up against a vertically solid structure. And the other thing that you have to do is you have to create in your a shaft, you have to create a flange on the shaft so that when the uh, shaft tries to move, this way or that way, it can't do that because it's pushing against these ball bearings and these ball bearings are pushing against this solid structure. But you still have all the advantages of a ball bearing. And you might want to notice one interesting thing is that the spacer for a thrust bearing is thin in this direction and fat in this direction, whereas the spacer for a ball bearing is thin in this direction and fat in that direction. So the spacer that works for a radial ball bearing is a different spacer than the spacer that works for a thrust bearing or axial ball bearing and that if you want that and, and now you may say, well, wh how, why is it that this doesn't just fall down like this why does it not do that and the answer is frequently they take a, a cutting let's see if i can make this 
they cut a channel in this flat plate so that these the balls of the uh, thrust bearing, these balls are into this carved out piece portion of a donut so that this cannot go up and down because these balls are pushed up into this cutout. And so now you have a shaft that has radial stabilization and has axial stabilization. And it's not hard for me to have the belief that you're going to look at this and go, yikes, oh my gosh, that is complicated and huge. Wow, man. See, we're trying to make something inexpensive that is a toy for children to play with. And this is a lot of parts, and it's big. And there's a question of, is that, boy, is there any way to get this in a more minimized format that's not as big, expensive, and complicated as this? And the answer is, yes, there's a trick. And that will be what we talk about next. All right. And uh, welcome back. And here we go. We're going to look at a trick. And the trick that we're looking at is a way to create an axial radial bearing. Uh, the bearings that stabilize against axial motion are called thrust bearings, and the bearings that stabilize against radial motion I sometimes are called radial bearings, but frequently they're just called bearings. If you call it a bearing, people will assume you're talking about a radial stabilization bearing. If you have a bearing that is stabilizing axial and radial motion at the same time, I have not been able to find a way or how they describe that. So I will call it a axial radial bearing or a radial axial bearing because why not? And this is it. And there's it doesn't make a lot of sense, I don't think, to really discuss this by doing that it's better off to go to the workshop and look at a few things first. Of course, most people would say, never show somebody your workshop. Not a good idea. But <clears throat> we will. Why not? Um, one of the things about SketchUp is that uh, SketchUp does not like working with these little parts. And so the workshop actually works with big parts. These are times 100. Particularly if you want to add and subtract solids, it's very, it's f usually unworkable, adding and subtracting solids that are small. Multiply them times 100, multiply them times 1,000. Then do your addition and subtraction, and you might be surprised that what used to be impossible is working fine. So that's why they're so big. And again, oh, another issue that you see is the whole bounding box problem goes away. You don't have it with big ones. You just have to remember how much you multiplied it by and do, uh, subtract it back down <laughs> by that amount. All right, so let's look at this for a second. As I'm, Here is the, the balls of the ball bearing. And I've taken that and worked out the diameter of it. Um, and again, this is a little bit of just technical stuff with uh, SketchUp. You can demonstrate hidden geometry and set the view to hide the rest of the model. And zoom down on these, these balls. And somewhere around in here with this ball is an axis. So you can grab an axis on this ball and put it right on the very end of the ball. Um, let's, let's try. Let's knock that one out. This might be less confusing. Okay, you can put an axis, and that happens to be the red axis. So you can put a red axis on this ball.
And if you wanted to get the diameter of the ball, okay, since it's a red axis, if you have a green rotation, you can bring this up until it is square to the ball, like that. And then you can take another uh, copy of this axis and put it over here. And you can get from that the diameter of this ball. That's really all I'm showing. It all has to do with invoking the hidden geometry and staying inside of your axes. So don't just draw any line. Draw a specific line. So um, let's get back out. Let's get back to um, not hiding the view, and we'll back ourselves back to a... Uh, bigger view so we have these um the balls here okay and if you have okay if this was a cross section of the bearing a radial bearing here's one of the balls and in a normal radial bearing that's just stabilizing it radially you want to have a structure that prevents the ball from going up and down but as a matter of fact, if you wanted to, instead of taking an axis and making a resistance area directly above the ball, you could actually make a resistance area that goes from above the ball to beside the ball. And the effect of this resistance area is when you try to move this ball up it runs into that and when you try to move this ball that way it runs into this so what you've done is taken one ball and stabilized it on two axes and the only way to make sure that that continues to happen is to have this other pressure structure down here that's pushing the ball up into that one but what you've done is created a set of raceways that allow one set of balls to give you both radial stabilization and axial sta stabilization. And that is what's going on. And there is a, a program in SketchUp where um, you, can take, you can take a um, pathway and choose Follow Me, and it whips this around and takes that shape that you just saw and makes that shape follow this pathway. And so now you have this structure here with this rounded off edge to it. And this rounded off edge happens to be the diameter of this ball because we measured the ball. And one of the things that SketchUp does, which I, it's not clear to me why, but it does, um, it tends to make stuff inside out and backwards, but you can have the solid inspector fix this uh, so that it turns itself into a normal solid and does not have anything wrong with it. Okay, so this structure going this way is this structure, and this structure is pushing that ball up that way and this structure here is, is it has been extruded to be this structure over here so if you put it together you can take this set of balls and push them up into that raceway and then this structure pushes those balls and holds them up in there like that the only thing you might notice is uh there's no uh, spacer here and you have to have a spacer because the balls will get all messed up if you don't and the uh, issue associated with the spacer for this is that you have to have a spacer that is in between the spacer of a radial ball bearing and the spacer of a 
thrust or axial ball bearing. And what you do is in, you don't want the spacer to go this way and you don't want it to go that way. You have it go this way. You have it, the spacer goes like this. Okay. And that's what this is. You just make a cylinder and then you shrink one side of it and it becomes a cone. And for all the world, it looks like that this is the bigger diameter here. And this is the littler diameter here. So the intuition is that your spacer should be set up so that the big end of the spacer goes in the big diameter and the little end of the spacer goes in the little diameter. But that's exactly backwards to what you want because you don't want the spacer to get in the way of anything. So you can take SketchUp, create your structure, then you can take SketchUp, the scale option of SketchUp, and scale it by minus one. And when you scale it by minus one, it makes a mirror image. That is so cool. All right. The other thing is, once again, I've adjusted the opacity of this down so that you can see what's going on. And you take this spacer and you put it over here. And what you will see when you look at this is that by luck, uh, when I made the spacer, it's the wrong size. It's not big enough because the spacer should intersect the balls at about their diameter. That's not a big issue because you can, if you want to, in SketchUp, take the spacer and make it bigger. You can just, you can universally enlarge its size. And so with a set of steps, uh, you can work with the spacer until you get the spacer that's exact. See, that's the small one. And then over here, we started enlarging it. And we got the spacer out to the size that it's supposed to be. Now, <clears throat> these balls that are inside this spacer, you do not want the ball to pop out. Of the spacer. You don't want it to do that. So the uh, hole that you cut in the spacer has to be a hole that is cut that has a uh, curve to the cutout so that when the ball is in there, the ball is prevented from popping out of the curve. And I don't know if you can see that, but the way that you do this is in SketchUp, you can... Uh, uh, you can, well, like, for example, these, these balls, and I'm, I'm just showing you how this works because it's, it can be confusing if you don't understand it, but these balls I made as a set of, uh, groups inside of groups, and the way you get this where it will behave itself in SketchUp is you take this group and you explode it and you take that group and you explode it and now you have these individual balls and then you can take this ball which is a solid with your SketchUp solid tools and subtract this ball from that and what comes out of it is your spacer now has this groove cut in it, a groove where this ball, if you tried to push it in there, it would resist it, but the spacer is plastic. So you push fairly hard and the ball will pop in there. And once it pops in there, it doesn't come back out. And that's how you do that. And there's your spacer. Okay. So now you can start to push these two structures together. And that is the next thing that we'll talk about to see how you can get a radial axially stabilized bearing with only the use of two sets of ball bearings in a much smaller structure. So there you go. That's the trick. Okay, here we go. Welcome back again. We're still up here in the workshop. And uh, 
what we've constructed is a device where if you take this and I'll put some color on it if you take that and this all right if you take these two you can hold them still and stabilize them where they won't go anywhere and if you hold them still and stabilize them where they won't go anywhere then you can take this structure and again this gets a little complicated uh, we'll have to take um, Okay, so we can take this structure here in the middle and let's just copy everything. So we can take this structure right here and um, We can rotate the structure in the middle and the structure in the middle will rotate and it will actually rotate even though these two structures are not rotating. And in fact, if you hold these two structures still stable and unmoving, then when you rotate this structure here in the middle, it is constrained and forced to rotate around only exactly in that circle right there. So this inner structure does not have permission to do this. It does not have permission to do this. It does not have permission to do this. It can't do any of that stuff. The only thing that this can do is rotate around and around. And if you uh, take one of these, and so now I'm going to turn it so that as we click things, they go away. So if we take one of these and look at it, we can make it a solid structure that has this flange sticking out of it. And so this is one solid structure. So if we wanted to, we could place right here the ball nut so that what happens is when you turn this it would turn the ball nut because the ball nut would have a flange on it and the ball nut would be bolted to this thing and the other thing uh, that we can add to this and that requires that we we go back down over here because i didn't get one but we can go all the way down into here Well, we it's it's there's an argument with us. We'll we'll try this one over here. So there's that whole group, and then we look inside that group, and then we look at this, and this is a gear. So we can take that gear and um Take that um, gear back up to the workshop area, which is up here. And here we have this special structure that we created. And we'll put the gear 
right there. Now, uh, this is what happens when you start working with these parts. Let's make it bigger by 100. So I'm, I multiplied its size by 100. And then we'll rotate it by 90 degrees. And you can just tell by looking at it for the purposes of demonstrating, multiplying it by 100 was a little much. Um, let's see if this has a center. There's the center that we can grab. So now we have this gear lined up on the rotating axis of this. And we can, just because we can, make this gear a little bit smaller. Maybe that size. And the next thing that we can do is um, We can take the gear and put the gear in there. And again, this is goes slowly because I'm actually doing it by hand by watching it, but I wanted you to see how this works. So now Remember, this internal structure, oh, so let's take the gear. Okay, so now we have this internal structure that can rotate, and it's got a gear on it. And I don't know if you can tell, but those red ones are not moving at all. And this is, gear is turning around. And the other thing that's turning is this flange right here. So we can... We can put a little red spot. Well, let's pick a different color because we're using um, red. So we'll put a yellow spot right here. And we'll... Uh, Oh, uh, well, uh, let's just put a similar yellow spot, like, right, well, done. Put a yellow spot right here. Okay, and so what you can see is that that gear is rotating, and so is that yellow spot, so is that flange. It's all rotating. So if we happen to have connected to, right here, our ball nut, then if we put a motor on here and turn this gear around, then turning this gear around would turn this flange around, which would turn that ball nut around. And if you had a ball shaft here, then when this ball nut started turning, remember the ball nut can't go anywhere. It can't go up, down, back, forth, front, and back. it can't do anything. So the ball nut is turning around and around and around, and what it's going to do is it's going to pull in that ball shaft if you turn it one direction. If you turn it the other direction, it's going to push back the ball shaft. So finally, what we have here is a mechanism that acts like the piston of a hydraulic cylinder but there's no hydraulic cylinder there's no hydraulics and there's no fluids and the only other thing that i uh uh would mention to you is that this is times 100 
you got to get this back down to the size of what you're working with. And if you take times 100 and make it smaller by a 1 100th, frequently it becomes so small that SketchUp, you can't see it in SketchUp. So my suggestion is take it from 100 down to 1 tenth. And when you take it down to one tenth, go find it and put it back over here and then take this that's now one tenth of that and do one tenth of this to get down to that. And that's the size here, this size. Let's see if we can measure if SketchUp may not even let me work with this little one because we get into this boundary box issue. But this is 1.1 inches. Okay, so now, and you can see that if that was up there somewhere, you lost it, you would never find it. So we can go back over here and copy that and uh, paste it uh, down into here. And there it is. And down here, it's um, 1.6 inches. And the reason I made it a little bit bigger is so that the diameter of this shaft here would uh correspond to the diameter of this so we went up times 100 we worked with it we got what we wanted and we came back down to the size that we're really going to use for the actual device and so now that you're an expert on this topic we can go look at some other things Okay, and here we go again. This is very close to a giant jigsaw puzzle. One, now, I took this and put it here. And then I took this and expanded it out so you can see here what all this is. And you might be saying, uh, that is not a ball shaft. And there isn't a ball nut in this anywhere. Here is that flange. So what is up here? And all I'm showing you in this progression is to take a shaft and get that shaft so that it has radial stabilization and axial stabilization in a structure that's fairly small. And I just wanted you to see one more time to me, the spacer is extremely counterintuitive. It just doesn't seem like it should be there this way. That's the small one. That's the big one. It should be flipped, but it's not. And if you look, you'll see this spacer is not touching anything over here. And if you want to look inside of here, you have to get your x-ray view. But you can see that the spacer comes down over here and it's not touching anything inside of there either. Um, so that's just to drive home the point because the spacer to me is counterintuitive. We'll go back up in the workshop. No, there just isn't, there isn't a view of it. Okay, this is not bad. Here's the spacer. Here's the inner part of the spacer on the inside. Down in here. Right there. And it's not actually touching anything. So the spacer is doing the precisely and exactly what it's supposed to do. It's maintaining those balls in their right uh, order of sequence inside the circle. And it's also keeping the balls from hitting each other. But in order to see this for doing the job that we want done, we have to go back over here and look at this. And I just wanted you to see all of this. And, of course, I, I painted yellow the contact zone where the ball bearings are being kept from moving 
and the prohibition on them moving around because of their contact with this two yellow surfaces, this one here on the inside and this one here on the outside, is what makes it a radially axially stabilized bearing. All right, so let's go back over here and look at the real deal. Now, remember there's a lot of rotational circle curve activity in here and there's a lot of linear activity here so we're converting rotational circular activity into linear activity so there's going to be a place where circular rotational type things are converted into linear things and that's what these blocks are so the inside of the block is circular and the outside of the block is regular and square and that's the conversion of circular motion into linear motion and uh, this structure here is very similar to the structure that we showed over there one of the things I wanted to do was for this to be very inexpensive and so I wanted much of it as possible to be made of plastic uh, and so what I actually decided was the parts of the, uh, the structure that the ball bearings are in contact with, if that could be a metal, uh, thin metal plate, then what you could do is take that thin metal plate and place it, uh, and again, let's go over here to this big one because we're going to go get into that bounding box but if you take a thin metal plate and place it inside of this block if this block is made out of plastic then the ball bearing the plastic stabilizes this plate and the ball bearings are rotating around inside of this plate and uh, there's a possibility that uh, let's see we'll turn this to hide There's a possibility that this could become, this is plastic, that's metal. I'm not sure. It, it may be easier for this whole thing to be just metal. I have a feeling if you took a block of aluminum or alloy aluminum that was shaped basically like a donut and put it in an anvil and put enough pressure on it that you might be able to create this entire shape with a pressing without even the need to do any machining. And remember, this is a toy, so it doesn't have to be accurate to a ten thousandths of an inch. You may be able to take a donut shaped piece of aluminum and put it in a press and create this entire structure with one stamping. And there's a possibility, I also think, that you could take your This other metal part, I don't know if I can get it to give it to me here. This metal part here, I have a feeling that this too could be created by taking a donut shaped piece of alloy aluminum and putting it in a press and just push, warming it up so it's ne not at its melting point, not even near to it, but close to its melting point, 75% of its melting temperature and put it in the press and push on it and you might be able to bring it up to this shape and if your pressing die was fairly smoothly finished you might be able to get this pretty smooth i, I again am in favor i like the idea of boron nitride boron nitride is a is weird it's almost like magic it's very hard very strong very resistant to temperature it's a um ceramic but you can deposit boron nitride with a vacuum deposition plasma jet so you could make a press a die and get it extremely highly polished and then deposit boron nitride on it as a ceramic and get a very nice smooth coating and it would stamp out these little metal parts for you inexpensively all right, so 
Oh, and again, um, notice the gear, notice the um, spacer. It's the exact same design as before. Now, these balls are, are a little bit bigger. The What happens is the amount of space that you have available in here for your ball nut and for your ball shaft, that diameter of that space opening is determined by either larger size ball bearings, one, two, three, four, five, six, like I have here. Or you could have little ball bearings, but you'd have to have a lot more of them. And I thought perhaps having a few of them is a better deal. Um, so, this becomes the structure that behaves as a hydraulic cylinder. And you are now familiar with everything that's involved in it. So uh, now the one that I did as an example had on it a ball nut that had a flange and the flange of the ball nut was bolted to a flange on the um, this uh, element. I don't know what you call this rotating thing, but the one that I made as the real deal, I actually have the ball nut as an integral part of this metal flange with holes in it for nuts and bolts, where this piece of metal is uh, brought into being a ball nut. And this, uh, uh, I have a little hesitation because I'm not quite sure if that's easy or hard or expensive or not expensive. It, it doesn't seem like it would be expensive, but I don't know that for sure. But it looks nice and it's small and it's a, a small number of parts. So this is an integrated ball nut that is m m by metal. This ball nut is, I think the ball nut has to be out of, out of metal. I'm trying to make as much of this out of plastic as I can. This probably has to be metal. And you'll notice that these four bolts go all the way through this gear and these four bolts land on and connect to this other side. So there's a gear in between and this is this uh, other side of the radial axial stabilized structure where you have to have two of these, two sets of uh, ball bearings on either side to properly give you the proper axial stabilization. All right. Whew. So everybody understands this. Uh, last thing we'll show you is a little tiny gear motor. A, a, a particular example or useful or interesting principle of this. Notice that you could make that gear motor bigger. It would just stick out more. I mean, this little gear motor, it doesn't stick out very much. There it is. But you could increase the speed of your linear action by just gearing up the motor. And you could increase the power of your linear action by just making the motor bigger. And everything that you did to make the motor bigger or slower or more torque or less torque or more power or less power or more speed or more speed... All of that can be done to this motor without doing anything to any of this. I think that's convenient to have them independent because then they become adjustable. All right. I really think we're at the point where we can leave this and we'll talk about the rest of this structure. So that's going to be our next thing that we talk about. All right. We are robot piston robot experts here. Now... Remember, uh, again, this has, it keeps getting into the bounding box problem. So if this gets out of control, I'll make it bigger. But the real one is 
two and a half inches by two and a half inches by 11 inches with the understanding or 10.9 oh well okay with the understanding that you can there's your 11 inches that you can make this shorter all you have to do to make this shorter is make that shorter make that shorter and make this ball shaft shorter everything else stays the same and i do and of course the strength of this device its ability to move an object is related to the compression and tension strength of this ball shaft and that involves you have to go out there and get um a tensile strength so this is 0 0.2 it's, it's a little less than a quarter of an inch you quarter inch of alloy steel that's pretty strong with respect to compression or tension and the uh, the ball nut it, it the, the t uh, pushing or pulling pressure that the ball nut can put on this is w remarkable how much force they can generate and there are programs on the internet where you can take the torque of this motor and you count out the um, turns per inch of the ball shaft and you can convert the torque of this motor into the pushing and pulling pressure of this device. And uh, these little motors, gear motors like this, are available on the internet if you go on the internet and look at them at the wholesale price they're like two or three dollars they don't cost much i don't know if i'm going to do a lot of that math at this point just be aware that these motors are specified of what their rpm and what their torque is and if you specify the torque of this motor and you have the turns per inch there are programs on the internet calculators on the internet where you just type all that in and it gives you the force my memory is this has a pushing force of like 60 pounds if i remember correctly now the important thing to understand is that if we're going to push this ball shaft out and pull it back like this was a hydraulic cylinder it's fundamentally important that the ball nut which is right here remember now you you need to notice that the ball nut is not touching this support structure okay it just goes through it but the ball nut is fully stabilized against radial deformation or radial abnormal uh, radial motion or axial motion internal to this device so the ball nut is going nowhere it's locked into place and as it rotates that rotation of the ball nut is going to pull this ball shaft forward or push it back but in order for it to do that it's Im Im critical that the ball shaft cannot rotate because if you put a lot of strain on it and the ball shaft can rotate and you put a strain on it and rotate the ball nut all that's going to happen is the ball shaft is going to rotate so you can see that i made the ball shaft it's the threads of the ball shaft end right here and i put a flat on it that's what this is that structure a flat and that flat is grasped by this clamp like structure that i created and i'm trying to make all of this um where it can be put together with screws. Okay, so this structure right here, these two, these screws, take this part here and pull it against that part. And inside of there is that shaft with its flat. So that when you bolt this thing down and pull those screws tight, um, 
they grab all, this thing becomes a clamp device that is clamped onto this ball shaft and will not allow the ball shaft to turn. And then if you'll look at the way this is oriented, these are rollers. So there's a piece of angle here and a piece of angle here. And the effect of these rollers being pushed up against that angle is that this uh, there's the angle is that this structure here is not able to rotate because if it tries to rotate this way then this will push against that and this will push against that and if it tries to rotate this way then this will push against that and this will push against that so this does not have permission to rotate and since this cannot rotate and it's clamped onto the ball shaft then the ball shaft cannot rotate and the strength of its ability to force this ball shaft forward is related to the rigidity and strength of these angles so while the whole entire structure itself can move around like if the robot was walking this thing could move but it has internal rigidity so that because of these little rollers up against these angle and because the angles are, are bolted together to these end pieces on each end, then the only thing that this can do is go that way or go forward or go backward. And so we spin, uh, let me just go out one more time. So we spin up the little motor and this shaft goes in and out. And what we have here is a uh, equivalent of a hydraulic cylinder, I think perhaps inexpensive um, and I'll, I'll discuss a little bit of how we get to inexpensive that's the next th thing that we'll discuss and we're back hello uh, it's all so clear to me uh, and I keep forgetting little parts so there uh, it, okay the inability of this to rotate means that the ball shaft does not rotate so that allows this to do one of the things that a hydraulic cylinder will do, which is that it pushes its rod out or it pulls its rod back. But there is another feature that we need to discuss. And it, I have to, I'm going to have to take me a minute to see if I remember how I lined this thing up. Um, what, I, what I'm doing is I've got to move these parts out of this thing in order to show you this other feature of this device so Okay, when this motor receives electrical signals from the controller and the motor spins this around, then the ball nut turns and this, if I did this right, this structure moves. So there it just moved, okay? So it, it pushed its shaft out. And um, one of the things that um, another uh, feature of a hydraulic cylinder is that a hydraulic cylinder uh, maintains its rigidity. It maintains its rigidity against deformation. So the... Um, The presence of the, the angles here all right I had to isolate this 
but the presence of these two angle irons here mean that one of the things that's critical to a um, hydraulic cylinder is that it doesn't do this even though it's under compression or tension force it does not make this maneuver and the reason why it will not do that and the other thing that it will not do is this both of those two axes of motion of rotation for the hydraulic cylinder are the what we're calling the equivalent of a hydraulic cylinder for it to distort itself and bend those are prevented because you have anchored the ball shaft in here inside of the ball nut and you've so that's one support position right here and the other support position is right here and this thing not only can this not turn but it can't go up and it can't go down, it can't go back and forth. So the extended hydraulic cylinder equivalent of this maintains one of the features of a hydraulic cylinder, which is that it maintains its rigidity and it doesn't collapse on itself. And the reason why it won't collapse is because the alignment of these uh, different but now and these these are little tiny really um bushing bearings i don't this doesn't really move that fast this is a this a high density polyethylene wrapped around an oil impregnated bronze bushing but you know if this is taking on heavy loads these can be converted to ball bearings if they have to it just increases the cost but uh, the fact that this is uh, stabilized from up and down and right and left um, decreases the probability that it will uh, be distorted, and that's important. Okay, now, and again, you'll notice with respect to um, back and forth, we've got we've only got it pressing against one side of the angle iron. So if you really wanted to beef it up some more, you could put another angle iron here and down here, but I don't think it needs it um, for the forces that we're going to put on it. The uh, final thing to discuss is I, my hope was, and you can see that this is made, it, it would take a little while, you'd have to read the directions, but there's nothing about this that a human being, uh, and of course I haven't shown it because it gets complicated, but these angle irons are just bolted into this. It's just a bolt that goes from here to there. Um, I think one of the ways I think it might be interesting to lower the price of this device would be simply to make all the parts and put them all in a bag and send this bag of parts to the person and they would assemble it. Uh, I believe the gear motor needs to be completely assembled. I think you could make a structure that would allow the um, a little press uh, part that came with it that would allow you to press the ball bearings into the spacer so that the ball bearings would be separate from the spacer and it would all be just a collection of parts and you would sit down with all these parts and you would put this together i'm hoping that will lower the cost i'm not sure that that's a bad idea if this is a toy for children to learn about robots and mechanical motion and things that can do this and that what is wrong with them putting it together themselves? How, how is that going to hurt anything? That seems to me like a good idea. Um, and again, I think this, 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 the bolt, the little, these are number six uh, bolts, and this is to scale, and these are number six nylon insert lock nuts. This... I think that could be plastic. This could be plastic. All of a lot of this could be plastic. I think that could, I don't. I think the gears probably need to be metal. 
the balls of the ball bearings need to be metal, but these inserts could be metal. Um, a metal insert set into plastic where the ball bearing, the balls of the ball bearings are rotating or rolling against metal, but the metal is set in plastic. So that this whole instruct, uh, structure would have a metal ball shaft and a metal ball nut and metal gears metal gear motor and the metal of these nuts and bolts but all the rest of it would be plastic and it was my hope that this would allow for the price to go down and the, the last thing we'll do is something that it just was interesting that i was noticing when you look at other companies that make devices that can do this. All right, <clears throat> and welcome again, everybody. <clears throat> we're glad you're here and we're glad you're back. Um, there are sort of conflicting uh, trails with respect to this device, mostly because it's very difficult for me to make something simple. I would rather make something that is perfect and can do anything. But I understand if you want to make something that's a toy, it's got to be inexpensive because you're not going to give to six, seven, eight year old children something that they're going to play with for three or four months and then put it in the trash and it costs $50. You can't do that. So these little parts are going to have to be inexpensive. And so I have to keep backing myself up to point out why this is inexpensive. Um, there are many things that you can talk about to say why it's inexpensive. The most important thing I think you can talk about with respect to it being inexpensive is making as much of this out of plastic as you can. Because plastic is easy to form, easy to work with, and it's not expensive. Uh, I do believe the ball shaft, they do make ball shafts out of plastic, but I think a plastic ball shaft is not going to have enough strength and compression and tension. It's an interesting question, though, because if this is a toy for children, how much compression and tension do you want it to make anyway? We don't want the children to be hurt. It seems intuitive to me that the ball nut, which we have, it's, it's way down in here, Remember, I added translucency to these structures so you can see through it, but that's the ball nut down in there. That, I think, has to be metal. These ball bearings, I'm not sure if they have to be metal if it's a toy. Now, we needed for this structure to have stability on axial motion and stability for radial motion. And surprisingly, and I'm going to change the, the, the view here, as you can see, as we drill down on these parts, this part right here, this part right here, is pushing against these ball bearings, and these ball bearings are pushing against this part, okay? But if we take this part and isolate it, you can see that it has a shoulder on it right here. And the effect of this shoulder is that the force on these ball bearings is in this direction. So that when these ball bearings are rotating, if you can get an angled force like this, you can have radial stabilization of the shaft and axial stabilization of the shaft without the balls scrubbing on each other. And the way you do that is these balls are rolling, okay? And so now we're going to, here are the balls. We're going to take this support structure and take a look at just it. And those balls are rolling around on a semicircular surface. And the interesting thing about this semicircular surface is I think this could be a metal insert into a plastic part, which would lower the price. The other thing I want you to notice is that the ball bearings that I chose are big. And the reason why they're so big is because I did not want to have a lot of ball bearings. 
a lot of these balls. I want them to be big enough to create this opening without needing a lot of them. And it does not have the spacer that keeps them separated from each other. Remember, any ball bearing, if this ball bearing is turning this way, and this ball bearing is doing the same thing, then this ball bearing, the motion of it right here is that way. And the motion of this ball bearing right here is that way. So this one is going that way. This one is going that way. They're scrubbing on each other. It was my hypothesis, if this is an inexpensive, low speed, low pressure toy device, you just take it. It's not a problem. You make these with enough space in there that they're sort of bouncing off of each other and rubbing each other and just pushing each other around. In other words, you have a sloppy actuator, a sloppy linear actuator. But the advantage of that is you do not have a spacer and all the complexity associated with a spacer and all of the price associated with uh, high tolerances. Now, surprisingly, even if you have this, okay, so here is this angled form here pressing against that angled form there this could be plastic maybe that could be a metal insert that could be a metal insert but this ball nut device is not going to be able to go that way but it certainly is going to be able to go that way so basically if you want to have total axial stabilization in any reasonable structure, you're gonna to have to have something like this on the other side. But remember, it doesn't have to have this level of connection to it because you don't need to have radial stabilization of this thing here and radial stabilization of it here. It's not necessary, okay? And so uh, all this has to do is not go that way. This can't go up and down it can't go forward and backward and it can't go it can't go forth it can go back but it can't go forth and if you want it not to go back or forth you have to put something here and what i put here uh was just a set of ball bearings and if you'll notice that these ball bearings are really just touching here and touching there so they are tending to be rotating like this or like this so they are not providing any radial stabilization to the ball nut because we don't need it. We've already got radial stabilization of the ball nut over here. These ball bearings are only serving to prevent this structure from going that way. And the way I was hoping that this would be built is, again, we will isolate this part and tip it up. That is a metal insert. But when we take this part and tip it up like this, basically when it came as a package, you would take the ball bearings and just drop them in there. And the reason why I made the ball bearings of this size is that if you drop them all in there like that, they would fix themselves. You wouldn't have to do anything. You just drop them in there. And I think this may help it to be less expensive. But... It is nearly just, it's almost essentially impossible for me to want to not want to make this thing better and tighter and stronger and have better capabilities. And I'm going to discuss all that. Um, that's going to be the next place where we go with this video series. And um, I just wanted you to see it uh, because... Uh, this is the very, very inexpensive one, and that is what makes it inexpensive. And now we're going to start messing around with, well, hang on a second. Let's just see if we can make this thing better, it's more stable, better tolerances. I guess the final thing I'm going to mention about the toy is probably you're going to have to put some sort of plastic if it was me, if I could, I would make this polycarbonate that you can see through so the children could see this part moving back and forth in here. But you've got to get it so they can't get their fingers in here and they can't get their fingers into these gears. And the reason why I picked this little gear motor is if you go to uh, 
suppliers of uh, wholesale, you can get these motors for 3 or $4. They're not expensive. All right, so there we go. We made it cheap. I resisted my temptation to make it better, but you can see all of this is how to make it better, and I'm going to go over that in a minute, but we're done at this point with the series where we're discussing making the inexpensive linear actuator equivalent of a hydraulic cylinder because if you want it to go this way you put the plus and minus voltage one way and if you want it to go that way you put the plus and minus voltage the other way and it's not sophisticated it doesn't have a servo controller it's a toy so there you go and now we'll go do some other stuff but i just wanted to wrap up the toy side of this i think that could be plastic that could be plastic that could be plastic this could be plastic this clamp it might have to be metal but on the other hand it could be that this is plastic with a metal insert so it will grab this ball shaft but this could be plastic perhaps these gears are plastic these balls are big enough that maybe they could be plastic um Okay, the inexpensive version will go on next to what tuning this up to make it better.